Okay, I'll let you guys take it away. Cool. Let's see. Can I, could you enable screen sharing? I can share slides with you. Yes, I'm going to make you a co host because I'm not sure how to yeah. otherwise do it. Yep, that always works. Okay. Okay, are you seeing the intro slide with the picture of Puffer's Pond? Yes. Great, okay. Well, thanks, Aaron, for having us. My name is Dan Shaw. I'm a landscape architect here at GZA, and I'll let my teammates introduce themselves. I'll, I'll, I'll be serving as project manager on, on this project. You guys wanna go around and say your names? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'm Anya Duffy. Um, I'm also a landscape architect. I've been um, working professionally in the, uh, with GZA for 15 years, and I'm also uh, an alum of UMass and, and know this area very well. Hi, I'm Steve Blecko. I'm the principal in charge for the project. I'm associate principal of GZA. I'm a planner and an ecologist, and I've been with GZA for 15 years as well. I'm Nat Arai. I'm a professional engineer. Uh, I've been with GZA for 15 years as well, and before that with Bay State Environmental Consultants, which was the East Long Meadow, became the East Long Meadow office of GZA. Um, I work in water resources and dredging and dam safety and, and uh, stormwater management. Um, so I'm excited to, to talk about this project with you. Thanks, guys. So it's a project we're all excited about. It's a site many of us know well. Uh, I'm a UMass alum uh, as well as Anya and Nat, and all of us have spent a lot of time here over the years. And the, the project encompasses the areas of expertise that our team has. So it's, it's one that we're excited about. I'll let Steve give an introduction to GZA and what our firm is all about. Okay. We've been in uh, Western Mass for you know, 50, 50 years or so, uh, but uh, you probably know of GZA. Just give you a quick overview. Uh, we were established in 1964, headquartered in Nor Norwood, Massachusetts. Uh, we have about 700 employees and our our company is 100% employee owned, which, um, you know, which I think is significant because, um, you know, everybody has a stake in the game at GZA. Um, I believe 90% of the people in our Springfield office are shareholders. So we have a vested interest in, in the outcome of projects and serving our clients. Um, we have five core service areas and those are depicted in the upper right hand corner there. Geotechnical, environmental, ecological, water and construction management. Um, so the the environmental, ecological, and water service groups are are the ones that would primarily service this project. Uh, as I mentioned, we have thirty offices, three in Massachusetts, including uh, the one in Springfield, and this project would be serviced entirely by our folks in Springfield office. Um, so with that, uh, we'll move on. I know we don't have much time, so let's uh, let's keep rolling. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. So this is a quick graphic we put together showing our understanding of the, the, what the project area is likely to be, Puffer's Pond in North Amherst and the surrounding town-owned parcels that form the, the conservation and recreation area that the town runs. And it's a valued conservation and recreation area. And those two elements can sometimes be at odds, which is a common, a common thing. And every so often to keep a place like this the way it is, the way that everybody loves it, some intervention is necessary because of the wear and tear that happens over time. So at Puffer's Pond, we're seeing sedimentation from Cushman Brook Delta and the adjacent South Beach swimming area, two sources of sand and material that are sedimenting into the pond over time. As sediment builds up, storm events and water flows move that material into the water body, making it shallower over time. And if nothing's done, you don't have a deep swimming pond anymore. You have kind of more of a shallow wetland kind of environment. So, so there's, there's that. There's issues with the upkeep of infrastructure and 
um, access to the beaches, ADA accessibility? Could there be improvements made to have accessibility all the way to the water? In some ways, Puffer's Pond is a victim of its own success where wear and tear on the trails, which are so popular, cause compaction, cause widening of trail footprint areas, erosion right near the water's edge. Some of the edging in, in an example like this deteriorates over time. Public safety issues, swimmers and visitors, you know, trying to keep them off of the cliffs and the dam, which can be tempting, but, you know, represent a, a public safety hazard, um, as well as stormwater issues and water quality issues. So there's all of these things that are happening simultaneously at Puffer's Pond that need to be put together in a master plan where we can sort out what's the picture right now, what needs to be done, what's the vision plan, and then what are the steps that get us there? And that's gonna be the basis for forming the vision plan for Puffer's Pond. So I can walk you through the, the scope of work that we proposed in our proposal that we sent to you. We would start with site investigation tasks and, and project initiation. We'd have a kickoff meeting with the town. We would discuss your goals for the project, your vision for Puffer's Pond. And at that meeting, we would also talk about potential stakeholders to engage in our next task, where we would want to have a, a stakeholder meeting where we've identified knowledgeable members of the community um, entities who are connected to Puffer's Pond in various ways. It could be different agencies of the town or other stakeholders to get that expertise together in a meeting. It could be held on site. There could be a lot of value in that, or it could be done virtually if that offers more flexibility to get more people to come. And then in, in our team, we would put together a base plan. We would gather together existing mapping that's been done of the area. We would take statewide GIS data, LIDAR contours, aerial imagery, um, materials from any reports that might exist and make a base plan upon which we can record our site assessment findings. And it'll also be the base for the proposed master plan that we'll create. We'll review previous studies. There was work the town did around 2010. We would review that. We would review previous bathymetry studies that have been done uh, in previous decades to get an understanding of what's happening in the pond and any other reports and plans that are out there, we would review. And then our team, once we have that background, would begin our site investigation. We would go out to the site, record our observations of elements like sedimentation, beach erosion, slopes, topography, ADA compliance, um, abutting properties, all kinds of you know natural features on the site, public safety concerns, record all that on the base plan and get a, a good understanding of what's happening. We would also conduct a desktop review of uh, wetland areas that are mapped already on GIS to get an initial understanding of where there's likely to be permitting considerations and identify those early. And then, all the findings from that stage are recorded by us on our existing conditions plan. And then it, it, optionally, you could have us do the uh, alternate tasks that we outlined in our proposal in the site investigation stage, which um, I'll let Nat talk about now. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so we identified three alternatives uh, based on some of the information provided in Aaron's uh, initial RF uh, request for proposals um, and then a, a subsequent conversation I had with her, um, which is <clears throat> um, because dredging the pond is, is, is uh, appears to be a major priority for the town um, and that the dam or the pond was dredged back in the 1990 period. Um, so there's uh, there's basically hard bottom bathymetry, if you will, of the dam of, of the pond bottom from that period. Um, so we proposed as an alternate, not knowing what the town's budgetary constraints may be, to do a bathymetric survey as part of the, the vision plan explorations. Um, the survey would be conducted in accordance with uh, Corps of Engineers standards for bathymetric surveys. 
We do not use hydrographic, electronic hydrographic survey equipment for ponds like this because of potential interference with vegetation, uh, aquatic vegetation. Um, so we do it physically with us using a, a mushroom anchor and, and a, making soundings um, and measuring, measuring the depth that, that way. And then we would put that together with um, the hard bottom information from 1990 and generate uh, surfaces and cross sections and from which we can do a quantity estimate on the sediment that currently is in the, in the pond. Um, that would later be used for design of a pond dredging program. Uh, we'd also, we also propose sediment sampling um, as part of that exploration to get a sense of um, what kind of contaminants are in the pond. We know that there has been some sampling done before and there, there are some metals and hydrocarbons in the pond, which is very common. Um, and um, <clears throat> so we, we would collect, uh, I believe we said three samples and, ha and have them sent to the lab for analysis. Um, and those would be done in accordance with um, the state water quality regulations, um, 314 CMR 9, which were promulgated after the last dredging of Puffer's Pond. So these specific requirements are for dredging projects in Massachusetts. Um, so all the sampling, the sample analyses would be done meeting all the, the analytes on, on their list and to their detection limits. This could then be used for future design and permitting if, it's, if that is advanced within three years of sampling. So it has value. There will be more sampling required in, in a future dredge design and permitting program. Um, significantly more, but if those samples are included within three the three year period, there's three less samples you have to to collect and, and submit. Um, and then the last um, and, and just the, about the sampling that also informs the disposal options uh, for sediment it's, it's disposal or what DEP likes to call re sediment reuse. Um, so those two items can really help you get a, a, a better picture of what you're looking at for a dredging program, which we would then sort of summarize in, in the vision plan um, so that then you could move forward with the, with the vision plan and say, we've got this data, we know we have, have this uh, kind of work to do ahead of us. Um, and then the, the final alternate was the South Beach area and um, survey and wetland delineation. And we felt like this is the focal point of Puffer's Pond. Everybody knows Puffer's Pond Beach, <laughs> um, who, who knows Puffer's Pond. Um, and it's the most used and, and quote unquote abused, if you will, uh, site within, within the conservation area. Um, and we felt like if, if you really wanted to get an advance on, on your design, we could really conceptualize things, really knowing what the topography is, um, where all the trees trees are, identify the tree species, all the hardscapes, and really be able to map that out and apply some concepts to to real firm knowledge of what's on the ground. Um, so we, we think that has value. The, the delineation would then be used for future permitting of, of, a, of a project there to, to renovate the beach area. Thanks, Nat. So there's a range of how extensive we could do the site investigation piece based on your interest in pursuing those task alternates. We think it's a good idea to do them. We would set you up for um, moving forward in, in a really well-prepared way. And then regardless of which options you picked, we, we would then move forward into creating the vision plan. So we would start off drafting a schematic rendered plan of the pond and surrounding area showing our initial ideas for proposed improvements. We would call those out. And um, the design process for that draft uh, design development plan, we would be looking at you know, focal points in the conservation area like South Beach and, and others, looking at issues that exist there and quickly working internally, coming up with sketches, loose ideas of different ways you could 
treat those areas. Uh, this is an example of how Anya and I work as landscape architects, sketching quickly to help visualize possible design options and then compare them, talk about the pros and cons and arrive at a preferred solution. So we would share a rendered uh, plan of, of the whole area with you in draft form, have a check-in meeting where we go over the, the design development plan, get your input, and then begin to make revisions according to that. And we would move into creating the final design. Our deliverable for final design would be a rendered full-scale plan of the pond and the surrounding area with enough detail to show general dimensions, materials, uh, conceptual level grading, and be detailed enough to generate a um, cost estimate. We would also include two photorealistic um, perspective renderings of views from the ground showing proposed improvements and we would select which areas uh, to depict with you. These are examples of some uh, 3D, some uh, photo realistic renderings Anya and I have worked on for uh, dam related projects. And that would be part of the, the final design package. <clears throat> so then the next task is to take that design that we've all come up with together and break it down into its constituent parts and identify an implementation plan. What are the tasks along the way? What are the, the, the mini design or engineering or construction um, projects that form that master plan? We would identify those and write a, uh, a narrative describing those steps, kind of um, phasing, prioritizing, um, the steps along the way. And this would take, we would also uh, write about um, permits likely required, as well as a list of possible funding mechanisms. So this would be a, a concise written report. We would develop a cost estimate, giving an order of magnitude cost that enables you to pursue grant funding towards implementation. And then we would compile everything that we've done into a vision plan report document. This would include a write-up of our site assessment work and our findings from that, a description of the vision plan, the implementation plan that I just described broken down into its, its constituent parts and priority items, a cost estimate, and then the graphics we produced would be in there too, the, the final plan and, and those renderings. We would have a meeting with you to review everything, um, go over the plan, go over the report, answer any final questions and enable you to take ownership of it and, and move forward with this plan. So you could kind of neatly present it when applying for funding or pursuing follow-up projects to make this vision a reality. So um, showing our price proposal here, we gave you a a lump sum fee in our proposal that we submitted a few weeks ago. This is a peek behind the curtain just at how we came up with that lump sum. Um, you can see most of the individual tasks that we think would be required, we can do pretty quickly and effectively. And uh, there'd be a deeper dive into a few of the tasks like site investigation, design development, final design. Those take you know more hours for more staff, but you know, this is work that we all do day to day in water resources, landscape architecture, engineering, um, ecological permitting, and this project combines what we know how to do effectively and efficiently. So um, we feel confident that we could get this done um, in with the level of effort kind of outlined here. And then the task alternates are itemized down there at the bottom of the table. We recommend uh, including those, if it's possible, it would just uh, make the most of that vision plan and really give you a, a jump start towards implementing it and getting into, you know, dredging and um, addressing some of those 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 issues. Um, the schedule, it, we updated this since the proposal that we submitted to you. Um, just to reflect where we are in the year right now, we would want to just make sure any site investigation we're doing is done 
before the site freezes over, if we're talking about bathymetry and uh, wetland delineation, we would want to um, get going as early as we could and do a lot of that this fall. And then a lot of the designing and the, the work back at our office, we could, we could do over the winter and have the project complete by the spring. Just to clarify, Dan, excuse me, that yeah. the, the if the if the alternates are not selected at this time, we could do all of the site investigation work. Um, it's just any in pond work could be eliminated by icing of the pond. So that's yeah. uh, that's the effect of you know shifting from what we had proposed as the September start to more likely a November start at this point. Yeah, but Nat, it's the case we could con conduct those things if we just started it promptly, right? Assuming this, we don't have a, a, an early hard winter. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know, a, an inch or, or so of ice on the, on the pond will, will eliminate any possibility of getting out there on a boat. We don't yeah. have an icebreaker boat. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that concludes our formal presentation. Again, it's a site that we all uh, know and love. It's a project that combines our areas of expertise, I think really neatly with the, the visioning, the master planning that we do in landscape architecture, the water resources, the ecological um, aspects of all of this. Um, it's a project that we know we could do a great job on and uh, we'd love to help you create a vision plan for Puffer's Pond. So. With that, if you have any questions, I think we still have a little bit of time. Thank you guys so much for <clears throat> preparing this and your very uh, synced presentation. We appreciate it. Um, a couple questions I have. Um, you had sh the first is that um, in the presentation there was a sort of a more of a, a detailed price breakdown in like a tabular form would it be possible for you guys to email that to me just so that we have that um, in hand <clears throat> when we discuss um, decision making and also um, if we we as staff in review of this sort of want to do line item by line item and eliminate certain things that we think staff could do internally um, like visioning and st things like that would that still be okay um, for us to say, well, we'd like to eliminate this line item in favor of something else um, so that we can kind of balance the budget and meet our needs a little more um, directly if we need to? I think the, the short answer is, is basically yes. We developed okay. this sort of our best guess at how we would complete the our scope based on our understanding of what you were asking for. But yeah, I forgot to mention when I showed that price breakdown that there's flexibility there if we wanted to adjust the scope. I think we would just want to discuss it with you to make sure that if there's, there may be certain tasks where it is ultimately more effective if we're following up on work we've already done in house just for the sake of continuity and our own yep. resources and understanding. But yep. there may be other, there may be certain elements that do make sense for the town to do. Um, in-house and then it would make our work you know a little bit leaner and it might make the project more efficient overall so yeah i think that's something we could discuss yeah Aaron, we actually we did you know we, we did anticipate you need, maybe needing to do that and wrote that in our price proposal mm -hmm. section that you know adjustments can be discussed so okay that's certainly not a problem um before we run out of time, no, I just wanted to thank you all for pulling this together. It's uh, been a while since I, I looked at images and it's always, you know, uh, pictures worth a thousand words and looking at the beach, looking at the perimeter trail, it just, you know, it really kind of hits you front and center how, how overloved Puffer's Pond is. And I remember years ago using a, a very similar phrase and and um, describing Puffer Spawn and the media picked up on that. And I remember seeing that, you know, that I think I said Puffer Spawn is being loved to death. And I, I think I still stand behind that statement. So it's 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 nice to, to, to finally focus a little bit. Um, no, I appreciate everything you've pulled together. Um, I guess one follow-up to, to Aaron's question, would it be possible as we, um, 
hear from other firms and, and we talk internally, would it be possible for you to share your PowerPoint that you use, all the slides that, you know, we're not going to share them with anyone else, but for us to to uh, go through as we consider uh, uh, our decision? I, I think so. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. in terms of the alts, um, I was just thinking, you know, um, <laughs> There was probably a little frost on the pond this morning, and and I hear you on the bathymetry work and and other work related to you know uh, the upcoming you know winter winter is coming fast. Could would would that work have to be done this fall, or if we ran out of season, could that work be done in the spring? Oh, absolutely, David. Yes, okay. uh, we just in 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 the in the interest of. Uh, being able to work over the winter on on the rest of the on the whole uh, vision plan, we mm -hmm. just were sort of thinking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. September, ideally, this would be going for yeah. Yeah. So ideally, absolutely. it'd be great to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. It just I just thought we, I didn't want that to be like a fatal flaw. Like if we don't, you know, if we if we move forward with with you all, that didn't seem like a fatal flaw. The bathymetry piece of it, because other work still can can move forward. No, absolutely not, David. That's, um, that's, we can yeah. certainly do that. Just it just you know postpones the end, the the, the finality of the project. But mm -hmm. certainly, um, or you know that could be a standalone item that doesn't go in the vision plan. It's you know, it's really this. There's a lot of flexibility here. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. No, this is good. I don't know if um is uh, Angela still on the call. She is. I don't know if Angela had any questions before we wrap. It's a compelling presentation, so thank you. And um, I look forward to someday seeing the renderings of the reimagined recreational spaces. So mm -hmm. thank you. I will say one thing that, you know, that I struggle with, although not as much as other people, but um, I can't tell you how many people through the years have said when I bring this up, you know, the, 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 the fact that we need to address some of these longstanding issues of buffers. Uh, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, but please don't change buffers. We love it just the way it is. And so, exactly. Yeah, love exactly. To death. <laughs> yeah, what I like to, to tell people in those situations is the do nothing option is also a form of change. If you don't mm -hmm. intervene and do some construction and some upgrades, continued erosion, wear and tear, cause the site to change over the years yeah. and you have a big mess you have you know roots jutting out into trails because the trails haven't been stabilized and reconstructed you have areas of washout the trail becomes harder to hike it becomes less aesthetically attractive it's all sorts no. of reasons why change yeah. is inevitable and designed intentional change is ultimately the way you have to go yeah no couldn't agree more and, and we're staring at this lovely picture of the pond but depending on your lens and, and all of us have different <laughs> lenses, but if you look at this with a, a landscape architect lens or an engineering lens or an environmental planning lens, you see the erosion staring you straight exactly. in the face of the beach. And then you have that lovely Delta um, that is that is growing and growing and and uh, going to go right across the pond all the way to the to the west. So it's going to fill in that whole uh, that whole section of the pond. It is a, a wonderful place to fly fish uh, from the end of that delta. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but um, but anyway, so yeah, couldn't agree more, and and really appreciate your time put, putting this together and and giving us a lot to think about. So thank you. Um, we. We appreciate it, and uh, we're we're committed to getting something done here at Buffers. I see, Aaron raised a Zoom hand. Yeah, we we have to adjourn, unfortunately, but um, I really wanted to just express our gratitude for your time and all of your work putting this together. And I will be in touch with you um, soon once we've uh, sort of determined a, a fi final decision on um, the uh, firm that we'll be selecting to to help us. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for Thank your time, you everybody. All. Thanks for having us. We Thank will you. be back in touch. Right. Take Bye. care. Bye, Nat. Bye. Bye, Aaron. All right. All right. Gonna, that was a and, great way to kick it off. Yeah. All right. And I've got our, our three folks waiting, so I'm going to admit them now. <clears throat>
Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to um, turn it over to you. I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware that we're recording. Um, so hopefully that's OK with you. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for um, coming back to present to us again. And uh, please take it away. Great. Sarah, do you want to go ahead and share our slides? I'm going to yes. make Sarah, I'll make you a co-host so you can present. OK, fantastic. Thank you. So while, while Sarah is getting those up, um, I'll just start with introductions. My name is Julie Busa. I am the lead for our water and natural resources practice here in uh, Fessenden O'Neill Springfield office. I'm an ecologist by training, uh, and I also co-lead uh, our Massachusetts uh, MVP program. So I do a lot of projects um, in the Pioneer Valley and elsewhere uh, throughout the state that are sort of bringing together climate resilience and watershed planning. Um, green infrastructure, dam removals, stream and wetland restoration. Um, those are kind of my specialties. Eric? Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Moss. I'm also with Boston O'Neill out of our Springfield office. Um, I'm a water resources engineer, and uh, my background is in uh, stormwater, watershed management, uh, water quality. And I also work with, closely with Julie on our MVP practice on projects throughout the state. Um, I live right here in Belchertown. I'm very familiar with uh, Amherst and I have two daughters at, at UMass and Puffers Pond is a uh, you know, very familiar place to us. So um, good to be here with you. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah, Sarah Morrison. Um, thank you for having us back. We're thrilled to be here to talk um, a little bit more about this um, fantastic opportunity for Buffers Pond and for Amherst. Um, I am a business line manager at Fessen O'Neill with a focus on climate adaptation. Um, by training, I'm a landscape architect and my work now focuses on bringing that sort of analysis at the site and watershed scale to climate adaptation projects of varying types um, and scales all over New England really, um, but I do a lot of work Work with Julie and Eric here in Massachusetts. Thanks. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview uh, for what we're hoping to, to cover and share with you this morning. Um, you know, Eric mentioned that he is uh, a resident of Belchertown. I live in East Hampton. I'm also very familiar with Puffers Pond and, you know, numerous times I've driven past in the summer and you see just all of the cars lined up, all of the people wandering around in their bathing suits. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the appeal and the sort of beloved nature of this site. So I think um, we're excited to be having an opportunity to talk about this project. And uh, as we started talking about it um, and had initial conversations back in the summer with Aaron and David, um, you know, I think we really got an immediate sense that there's a compelling story here. Um, and it ties in with climate change, it ties in with environmental justice, and those are key funding priorities for a lot of agencies right now. And so there's there's really, um, we think there's a, a very good probability of moving your needs and your vision forward and being able to fund that and really make a difference at Hoppers Pond. But, but what the town needs is a cohesive vision to do that. And so, um, you know, having a, a plan and clear steps and knowing how they all fit together to address the varying needs at the site. And then also knowing how to kind of match up funding site, funding sources and stack those together to actually get things moving forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah in a moment. Um, she's gonna go over sort of more of our understanding of the project background and the town's objectives, uh, what we propose as a planning process to develop this vision and then what those outcomes and, and an actionable plan would actually look like. Great, thank you, Julie. So um, I thought we would start here with talking a little bit about some of the goals that we've heard along the way, both um, and initially before we got in contact with you this summer, and then during our conversation with um, Aaron and David, some of the sort of refinements to those goals that we've heard from you. Um, <clears throat> what we've heard is a, as Julie touched on, a sort of um, a wide range of desires to address a lot of different things going on, right? Um, there are some key issues, clearly the dam improvements and water quality, looking at the pond and the conservation area around it and the health of those habitats and ecosystems would, would be top priority, safety um, and, and sort of uh, management of the dam long-term. But there's all these other things as well that we heard about 
<clears throat> improvements at the beach. We talked a little bit about um, you know, the sediment and sand that's brought in and, and the process involved in that and, and, and um, how important that is to maintain that beach for the community. Um, balancing conservation goals and site use is a really tricky thing to do um, in a place that, you know, I, I think I quoted you, David, when we met last of, of that, um, you know, we're loving Puffer's Pond to death. Um, and that, that is a real thing that can happen in spaces like this, um, where the community embraces a natural resource um, as wholeheartedly as has been done here at Puffer's Pond. So that's something that we would definitely want to be responding to and sensitive to. Um, retaining the character of Puffer's Pond was a big part of our conversation last we spoke as well. And, you know, the, it, there, there are some elements of Puffer's Pond that, that feels a little bit like it's, it's stopped time um, in, in a fantastic way, in a way that you want when you go to um, a place like Puffer's Pond. And we, we would want to make sure that any, any improvements made to the pond itself, to the surrounding um, sort of more recreational spaces re remain true to that sort of historic use and feeling of Puffer's Pond and, and um, help it move into the future without making it feel um, like a different place. And then there's also increased accessibility. We talked about ADA, we talked about safety on the street, um, the bridges, the trail improvements, and we talked about some of the challenges around signage and wayfinding. Um, <clears throat> and all of those things, again, bring us back to this sort of overarching question as well of you know, what will happen to this pond moving forward in the face of climate change and what, you know, what there's, there are sort of two parts of that. There's how, how will the pond itself and those ecosystems evolve through the changing climate, but also how can this place be a refuge for the communities that surround it through an increasingly um, hotter climate that we are encountering. So those are some of the goals that we've heard through the process and um, some of the things that we've taken to heart as we craft this sort of process that we'll run through. But, um, you know, based on everything that we heard from you, um, and also reviewing the materials that Aaron, you know, you shared with us, we started to really kind of pull together some bigger picture objectives, which I've got listed here towards the bottom of the screen that we thought were necessary or needed in order to get where it seems like you want to be going. And so um, based on that specific um, feedback that we got from you, we've developed a sort of short list here um, of the big picture needs that we think will begin to shape what we're calling a roadmap to get you where you wanna go um, for all of these various goals. So in terms of laying out this roadmap for how to address the specific goals identified, um, as well as the big picture needs, we've laid out a potential sort of four-step process, which would set you up with both a comprehensive vision for the site, as well as an actionable plan leading to implementation. It's it, and that that sort of combination of <clears throat> planning scales and um, actionable planning is is a, a thing that we we try to in, include in all of our planning processes at Fuss and O'Neill. It's very important to us as a firm that we not produce planning documents that are just plans that sit on a shelf, but rather they're the beginning step of a, a actionable dynamic um, path forward for you. So I'll go through the four steps at a high level here, and then we'll sort of dive a little bit deeper into what all four of those steps would entail and what would be the outcome of those steps as well. But essentially it's this sort of four pronged approach where we, we start with what we call investigate and engage, where we sort of start digging into the site, we start digging into, the needs and desires of the stakeholders involved. Then we move on to initiate and explore where that's really kind of the real meat of the, the planning where we take what we've heard in the first step and we really start to dig deeper into what has been done, what needs to be done, what does that look like spatially at the site scale, the watershed scale. I'll talk more about that in a minute. We then move on to what we call implement and estimate. And this is a critical step. And this is where the plan really becomes actionable. So this is where we start to develop that real roadmap based on the vision that we create in Initiate and Explore. And so we would 
we would be developing short and long term phasing plans, looking at costing, as well as potential funding mechanisms so that, we, you know, when we deliver this to you, you're set up to hit the ground running to pursue those next steps. And we conclude with issue and educate, which will be um, sort of a graphic report and presentation to all of you summarizing all of the efforts and as well um, a mechanism for sharing that message out to all of the uh, stakeholders in the community at large. Oops, went the wrong way. Okay, so um, I'm gonna dig in a little bit deeper to the first two steps first. Um, so investigate and engage really focuses around <clears throat> all of us kind of as a team really digging into all of the past studies that have been done, all of the past work that's been done at Puffer's Pond. There's been a significant amount of work and it's very important to us that we build upon that rather than um, duplicating any efforts that have already been pursued by this by the uh, by Amherst. So um, that's where we begin always. And we would also plan to do what we call a walk shop with a project stakeholder group where we meet on site and we walk and workshop together. Um, you have an opportunity to point out certain key things to us. We have an opportunity to really ask questions and dig into some of the potential solutions there on the site. We find this is a very productive manner to involve the community, um, certain key community stakeholders or the larger, broader community, depending on the project. We do it both ways. Um, very productive way to have a, a sort of working um, workshop with the stakeholders. Um, we would be uh, studying existing opportunities and constraints, really, really looking at the limitations of the way that, that some of the recreational um, spaces have, have been shaped over time, um, opportunities for how to incorporate some of those things into the larger picture. We'd be looking at um, ecological cues on site. We'd be looking at um, digging a little bit deeper into those reports and understanding um, the, the sedimentation and, and um, contamination, et cetera. So we'd be really looking at both what's happening there and how are those things um, currently working as challenges that we can turn into opportunities moving forward. We'd also include a design team workshop. So what we do generally, um, often is we'll have a workshop for several several hours with the project stakeholders on site. And then sometimes that same day, the design team will stay on site and continue to sort of do an internal design workshop on site for, um, for hours at a time, because we find that it's a really expeditious way to document our thoughts, to document what's on the site, to get those ideas um, from the stakeholders down on paper and really think through the area while in the area. Um, we, we find that to be very productive before going back to the drawing board in the office. And all of that would lead to compiling a base map um, that we would be working off of. And that would sort of kick off the next phase which is this initiate and explore. So we would really be taking all of the ideas, thoughts, concerns, goals, data that we've gathered in that first um, step and digging deeper into exploring those things. And when I say exploring those things, um, I've sort of listed a list in the bottom left-hand corner here on the slide of what those things are, right? And, and it's certainly not limited to the things on this list, but I wanted to show you some of the, some of the real aspects of, <clears throat> of data that we would be looking at um, everything from climate risks and impacts to stormwater management, both at the site, but beyond at the watershed scale, programmatic use, pro programmatic problems, like, you know, what, what's working and what isn't in the terms of how the site's being used, um, both from a human perspective, but also how that use is affecting the, the health and the quality of the, of the pond as well, surrounding habitat. Um, adaptive management needs, um, certainly the necessary dam improvements, all of those things would be really, um, we'd be digging deeper into all of those things at the same time as setting what we call the guiding principles for the improvements. So we would together with you be developing some real sort of touchstones that we would use throughout the an analysis to make sure that those initial goals that are shared are carried through um, all of the recommendations throughout the plan. 
the result of this phase would be a colored rendered vision plan for the entire Pepper's Pond, um, areas beyond where necessary to sort of connect the larger watershed scales, and also the, um, some photorealistic renderings, which will really help in terms of getting the community to understand uh, the efforts being made um, by Amherst. And the following step is what we call implement and estimate. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about this because to us, this is sort of where the rubber hits the road, you know, it, and coming up with a vision plan for seeing how all of these sort of disparate pieces and parts come up and make a, a real sort of holistic vision is one thing, but then coming up with this real sort of actionable plan. <laughs> That's what we want to get to, and that's where that's where this is where that happens. So, um, we develop an implementation strategy, and by that, usually we start by doing um, uh, prioritization criteria, and we'll work on developing that together with you. Um, some of those things can be what I've listed here. We'll develop that based on what works for you with um, in Amherst and. Um, you know, we'll look at things like cost effectiveness, but measured by relative costs and estimated benefits. So not just, you know, what's the cheapest project to get done? You know, what, what are the projects that, that give, a, give you the most bang for your buck and how, how can we prioritize those? And some of those will be very cost effective and some of those will be bigger investments and we'll help you work through what gets you the most benefit in the end. Um, we will look at permitting and regulatory feasibility as well and sort of prioritize projects based on what we can get through pretty easily and what may, might be a larger effort um, and take more time. We'll look at just overall sort of complexity and timeframes in terms of making some of these um, implementation decisions and priorities. And we'll also look at benefits to the broader Amherst community. And like Julie mentioned, you know, some, some of these larger community goals are really coming to the forefront in terms of of um, making grant applications competitive. And you know, some of these bigger grant programs are really leaning on the community benefits in ways that um, are fantastic, but also make it really critical to centralize the community in, in any work that's being done right now. Um, we would be setting up a roadmap essentially for short and long-term phasing. So both things that you can start knocking off the list in the near term and also things that need to be packaged together with a longer term approach. Um, we would sort of set that up for you in a way that is attainable um, for where you are now. Uh, we would include order of magnitude cost estimates based on sort of, it can either be based on phases that you sort of intend to implement or by project. Um, and we would definitely be including potential opportunities for revenue streams, looking at sort of having a co conversations around, you know, how, how can you introduce other ways of, of creating some revenue here um, for Pepper's Pond. We talked a little bit about that last we met, um, as well as identifying po possible other funding mechanisms. So, and that's something we, do, we work on a lot and, and have a, a great um, track record in terms of helping communities get get that funding um, that is so abundant right now. Um, the, the final step then is issue and educate. And really this is about bringing all of it together um, into a presentation for you, but also I think you know we include in our scope the idea of sort of preparing, packaging all of this as a GIS story map website so that you have, which is easily linked to your own website and or can stand alone so that you really have a way to communicate out to the community without, um, if, even when not having community meetings, what's going on with this, easily updatable in terms of tracking progress and having it be a living document. So that would that would be um, where we would hope to, to leave that part of it with you. Um, and to conclude, I, I'm gonna hand it over to Eric to sort of talk about, you know, we, we've done some brainstorming internally about what some of these potential improvements and possible funding mechanisms um, could be and how that could, could look on the other end. Clearly, these are things we would work through together with you, but we did want to kind of leave you with a sense of, of some of our thoughts as they stand now. 
Great, thanks, Sarah. So yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of our ideas and thoughts about specific improvements that we've seen you know, recommended in some of the, the various um, you know, previous planning studies and work that's been done on, on Puffer's Pond, and then talk about how we might align some of these funding mechanisms to really augment the, the, the town's own funding sources for some of this work to kind of leverage uh, what the town has using um, some other state funding that we've been successful with. So in terms of the, um, the water quality improvements, we kind of see this as a two-pronged approach, uh, both in pond strategies and then looking at the watershed itself. Um, you know, we, we know that there is, you know, a fair amount of accumulated sediment, both on the east and northern sections of the pond where the, where Cushman Brook comes in at that, the delta that's formed there. And then um, sediment that's kind of, kind of gotten over and exceeded the capacity of that, that trap or, or four bay area that was constructed in the pond. So um, the dredging feasibility work that the UMass folks did, you know, a few years ago is a, is a good starting point. And I think it does a good job on kind of establishing a baseline of um, you know, sediment volumes, uh, the quantity of sediment and sort of the areas of the pond for focus in terms of sediment removal. They also did a, you know, a decent job of looking at a few of um, specific contaminants in the sediment, I think pointing to you know, the high potential for there being legacy contamination here, just given the, the industrial uses um, you know, of, the, of the river upstream of the pond and this, this sort of being you know, the, the sink for a lot, a lot of those legacy pollutants. So we know that there's gonna be some expense associated with um, sediment disposal. And what we need to do is um, to better characterize you know, the sediment quality you know, fully for, to get a better handle on um, you know, what is the, the feasibility for dredging the quantities of sediment that we, you know, we believe are needed to restore some of the, the depths for recreation throughout the pond. Uh, we also, you know, are, are thinking about issues in terms of, you know, nutrient sources and, you know, we, we know that, you know, this pond, like all, all ponds, is, is gradually transitioning, right? It wants to transition back to a wetland and, and marsh environment and, um, you know, not only the sediment, but nutrients can have impacts and, and, and cause, you know, things like nuisance aquatic vegetation to grow, you know, algal blooms, um, those kinds of issues. So. Those are also things we look at in terms of you know, potential nutrient impacts and, and is there a, a large nutrient source of you know, phosphorus, particularly in the sediment um, that could also be remediated to kind of prolong the, you know, the longevity of, of any dredging operation there. In terms of the, uh, the watershed itself, you know, we, we know obviously there are sources of sediment still continuing to, you know, to um, enter the pond. And so we look at um, you know, stormwater as a source and what are some of the stormwater management measures that are um, ongoing in the in the watershed, are there opportunities to implement you know green infrastructure, stormwater practices that you know would be appealing to funding sources that would also kind of shut off some of the ongoing sediment sources to the pond. Um, we're also looking at uh, options for beach repairs and and how does the town manage you know that that process of replenishing you know the, the beach sand without impacting the pond. Um, looking at areas of you know shoreline stabilization you know riparian buffers you know ways to kind of trap and hold sediment so that you're you're not having this ongoing source coming into the pond prolong the life of the dredging operation and then other other strategies to address sources of sediment i mean is is the stream itself you know in terms of the the geomorphology of the stream is there erosion of the stream bank and bed is that an ongoing source of, of sediment given sort of the high gradient nature of this stream historically being used you know for to, to power mills in the past so those kind of questions i think could be answered you know with a little bit more focus on on the watershed itself uh, we did review the you know the recent or fairly recent uh, dam safety inspection report i know there are a number of immediate repairs to maintain overall safety and functionality of, of the dam itself. Um, we also noted that there is a, a separate dike that um, you know, was, I think was not quite evaluated uh, during the recent inspection report. And, but that report essentially recommended both some short range tasks and then some longer term uh, tasks. And the longer term tasks require you know, some additional work, things like evaluating the structural integrity of the overall dam, I know that the last inspection, um, the, the consultant was unable to look at the upstream face or the downstream face of the dam. 
And so a you know, dive inspection, it would probably be in order. So there is some work to be done to fully evaluate, you know, the overall, you know, fixes and, and, and you know, what makes more sense to, um, you know, address some of the dam safety issues there. And then the last set of issues here that I think, you know, both Sarah and Julie alluded to was this idea of climate resilience and adapting, you know, the, the pond itself in terms of the, the water quality conditions and the habitat conditions to a changing climate, but also ensuring that, you know, this recreational resource can continue to serve as a key, you know, cooling center and a place for people to go to escape some of the you know, the kinds of summers we just had where you know, we're getting these hotter, you know, drier spells and it's really impacting, you know, certain populations, you know, climate vulnerable populations, EJ communities and folks that we know are, are relying on Puckers Pond and other, other similar recreational areas to, you know, to stay cool in the summer. <clears throat> so I think that is an opportunity, but it also is a way to leverage, you know, some of the grant funding right now that is really focusing heavily on both um, you know, both uh, heat and uh, water quality or, or flooding issues. So as we mentioned, you know, in terms of possible funding sources, you know, our firm has had a ton of success with the Mass MVP program. Um, we've been, we worked on, I think, somewhere between 30 and 40 action grant projects to date. And we're, we've been working on a you know, large number of them over the past few years, helping towns throughout the state address, you know, a full range of uh, climate resilience issues. Uh, right now, we're working on another, another a water quality project on a pond on the Cape, looking at um, how harmful algal blooms and ways to uh, better manage stormwater inputs to that pond uh, and other, other kind of nutrient sediment sources to re reduce, you know, some of the, the nutrient loads and the sediment loads that are contributing, you know, to those, those algal blooms. So we know that MVP can be used for, you know, water quality projects focused on, on ponds particularly when we kind of combine that with, you know, the key aspects of using the pond as a, as a key, you know, um, resource for the community, you know, for heat adaptation. I think there's a lot of potential there to you know, kind of incorporate a number of these holistic issues um, and centered around climate adaptation and be successful with the MVP program. Um, there are a number of other programs. Obviously, the, the DCR Office of Dam Safety, the Dam and Seawall Grant Program, is the most logical choice to you know, address some of the dam uh, repairs that need to be made. Um, one of the, the other programs that we've had success with recently is this Massachusetts Community um, Compact Best Practices Grant Funding Program, which funds communities for a range of projects that look at implementing uh, best practices surrounding infrastructure, surrounding water resources and other, other types of issues. And so recently we helped the uh, help Gardner actually get about $40,000 in community compact funding to do a vulnerability assessment of one of its dams. And so they're looking at uh, potential ways to um, address some dam safety issues. And so uh, we believe that there's additional money left over for this. And this could be a good uh, funding source to help you Maybe do some of the, the additional assessment and engineering, you know, on your on your dam to make it more competitive for the dam and seawall program, which tends to likes to see, you know, some work already done in terms of planning and assessment to support a you know, competitive application under dam and seawall. So that could be a, a good source to tap into some remaining funds there. It could be on the order of fifty thousand dollars or so. That's what we've been seeing for, you know, awards um, potentially. And that could really set you out nicely for a competitive dam and seawall uh, grant. There's also other sources, you know, Community Preservation Act, you know, is a potential source, uh, tapped into some funds there. And then there is an all, also a, a park and open space recreation related grant program, this Parkland Acquisition Renovation for Communities or Park Grant. And we've seen a number of communities, including um, East Hampton recently, get money to uh, fund some other, you know, kind of open space recreation park improvements that. I know you're also looking at as kind of a secondary, you know, a consideration here, but could could round out the uh, the funding package you know, pretty nicely. So, those are the main programs that we see. Um, there are a few others that are out there, depending on some of the water quality issues. You know, Mass DEP, the 319 program can be used to fund you know, stormwater improvements. Um, that program is a little bit tricky in that it is looking to prioritize impaired water bodies. And we know that uh, the pond itself has not been assessed by the state 
even though downstream uh, Mill River is, is has been assessed, and we, we know that E. coli and bacteria are issues there. So there may be a way to tap into some Mass DEP uh, 319, 604B funding, but really we see MVP, Dam and Seawall, uh, the Community Compact, maybe a few other sources to really augment you know, what you're looking at for your, your own town funding. So I'm going to turn it back over, I guess, to Julie to, just to wrap up. And yeah, I think really at this point, um, we wanted to open it to discussion and um, you know, see if there are questions that you have, things that you want to hear more about or dig into more deeply. Thank you guys so much for um, coming back again to, to present. Uh, we really appreciate it in the context of us um, kind of doing an RFP and getting some other firms to um, get some proposals together so that we have, um, we're sort of, we're doing this the right way. Um, and so I really appreciate your time and all of your efforts here. Um, and I just wanted to applaud your presentation that um, seems very well thought out and holistic and um, hits hits the mark in terms of a lot of the issues that we um, are trying to address out there. Yeah, no, I would I would just echo that. Thank you so much. I, I, in particular, I, I yeah, was reminded in your your presentation about the, you know, the elements of climate change and and also working with environmental justice populations that puffers is is um, you know it is this this focal point in the summer not only of Amherst but of the region and it is has been as long as we've owned the pond it has been free and open to the public dawn to dusk mm -hmm. 365 days a year and in particular during those summer months in fact Angela just and I interacted this morning and. Some gentleman had called and said, um, is it safe to swim in Puffer's Pond? And I looked at the calendar and said, it's October 19th. <laughs> they, people are still swimming in Puffer's Pond on October 19th. And he wanted to make sure that uh, we took down the signs that we we did have some E. coli spikes late in the in the year. And I, I am quite confident those are probably... Um, uh, fine now, but if if he wants to swim at his own risk on the nineteenth of October, then so be it. But but reminded that that it is a resource for many people of all uh, all all races, all generations, all income levels, and and the region. So we want to make sure that the planning we do takes that into account. You know, for future generations. Um, and um, yeah, also reminded that we we are loving puffers to death and. Um, and it is not going to get better on its own. The beaches, the sedimentation, mm -hmm. um, the dams, the dike. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, I will just add that we did, since you brought up the dike, uh, we, we did, we, we have had some legal work done on the dike. Um, and and our, our legal team in Boston is kind of looking at that, did have some pretty extensive title work done on on the dike and whether that is our responsibility or the responsibility of the property owner, still a little bit in question, but um, either way, we're gonna have to move forward with some some uh, repairs to that dike. So thank you. Thank you for your time this morning and pulling this all together. I don't know if Angela has anything she wants to chime in on. No, it's pretty comprehensive. I especially appreciate the funding, um, the listing of the funding sources, but I just wanted everyone to know the gentleman is going to wear a wetsuit, so. <laughs> <laughs> he good. also he also has a swimming buddy safety first. That's good. So, um, That's great. A wetsuit and a swimming buddy. Yeah. Good. Right, safety right, first. Right. That might raise even more questions, but I'm glad that they'll be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well thank you all. I mean, I, I think David, to your point, we re we really also see Puffer's Pond as a regional asset, and you know, we we called this a catalytic study because it does feel like this sort of coming up with a comprehensive action plan for moving these things forward incrementally feels like it it will it would and could and should be catalytic for not just the pond but but everyone who comes to it and so really in that way it's a it's a regional scale project so mm -hmm. thank you for having us again yeah and we would if you don't mind we will not share them but we would love to have i know i believe we taped this session but i would love to have we would love to have your slides as we think about, 
you know, the firms that are presenting to us, uh, that would be very helpful for us to go through uh, uh, in the days ahead. Happy to share. So great. Well, thank, thank you, you all. Have a thank have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. You as well. Bye now. Bye, everyone.